recording and sharing the screen. Brittany, can you tell me what you're seeing there? I am seeing painting of the romantics art with the heart. That's exactly right. So we're in sync here. Uh, today we're going to finish up with the romantic period. I'm going to be only talking about two artists. There are dozens and dozens of famous romantic artists from the romantic era. I've chosen what I think are the two most popular. Popularity is a thing of preference, and they're certainly my two preferred uh, artists. This romantic period is a reaction to the Enlightenment period. Remember the art form in the Enlightenment was the neoclassical art. Uh, Jacques-Louis David, I've mentioned you need to remember his name. Uh, paintings like the Tennis Court Oath, uh, the Death of Socrates, Napoleon, those paintings, very strong images, uh, strong formation and structure, uh, heavy with uh, idealism of sacrifice and nationalism. The paintings of the Romantics are a reaction to that. Uh, they, the area, the era of Romanticism starts in the early 1800s, sometime shortly after the French Revolution, and moves on. And there are five eyes. You can see these five eyes on the screen in front of you. Idealism. We can make a better world. We can make this a better place. Uh, but in order to do that, we've got to we've got to quit worrying so much about science and and stuff like that. We need to think about experience and feelings. So idealism is the first eye. The second eye is imagination. Using your imagination more than reason. I've often wondered what imagination is and how it's characterized and what part of the brain is our imagination uh, located. But that's a question of reason. Imagination, how can we imagine? Uh, a, a current term that we like to use is reimagine. How do we reimagine the way things could look? Third eye is individuality. This was particularly true in America. Uh, they celebrated the individual and, and uh, people, they celebrated people taking a stand for individualism. The term in America became rugged individualism as people pushed west, pushed the uh, frontier west. Uh, fourth term is inspiration, that artwork should inspire. Artwork. Okay, can we all make sure we're on mute, please? Thank you. Uh, artwork should inspire. It should... It, Artwork should inspire. I'm a very, very jealous mother when it comes to that. From God, Caroline. Caroline. Would you mind muting your Caroline? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You'll mute. That will help. We can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so the fourth eye is inspiration. Um, the, the work of art should inspire. And the fifth eye is intuition. Have you ever wondered what intuition is? Uh, this is one of those places where I truly believe that women have a better capacity for intuition than men. Um, there is some research on this. There's a, quite a bit of research that men have better situational awareness of what's going on around them, where women have better intuition. Um, uh, and, and I... I don't know. I mean, I this is one of those things to me which I don't think you can determine from a uh, chemical of the brain or anything like that. To me, this is part of that dualistic thing that Rene Descartes talked about. Anyway, that's the five eyes of individualism. So this first artist we're going to look at is Claude Monet. One of my two favorites, again, we're going to look at Monet and we're going to look at, at uh, Van Gogh. Uh, Monet, look when he's born, 1840. So that's 40 years or more, uh, around 40 years since the Romantic era started. So it's well into it. So, I mean, he's born into a climate of romanticism. But if you remember, there's a sibling growing up right alongside the Romantic era, and that's the Industrial era. So you've got these two siblings growing up that are very different. Well, Monet is kind of a, he's a child of the Romantic era, but he's very much influenced by the Industrial era. Um, Impressionism, this was a name owned and given to us by Claude Monet. If you ever get a chance to go to a Monet exhibit, please do. Uh, Jan and I, my wife and I went up to Kansas City here a while back where they had a Monet exhibit. It was just so out, outstanding. Uh, Monet gave us this word impressionism. What is your impression when you look at anything? What feeling does that bring forth from within you? How are you impressed? How do you describe that impression? And it all, that's a combination of imagination and intuition as it integrates forth from the individual. So it's, impressionism is a, is a, is a powerful word. It's very descriptive. It, it encapsulates this romantic era or romantic period of time. Impressionism can be cons considered the first modern art movement because we are moving out of the enlightenment into the era, era of modernity. Now we're no longer in the modern era. If you're modern, you're out of date. We are now in the postmodern era and that's a class in itself. But impressionism is this first thing where we really start thinking about feelings. It's not considered a very masculine thing usually, and I'm not exactly sure why, but um, uh, people who cannot get, men who cannot get in touch with their feelings are often accused of toxic masculinity. Um, I don't, I don't know about any of that. I don't understand any of that. I just think we all have feelings. Some of us hide those feelings better than others. Sometimes we even hide our feelings from ourselves. 
And I don't know if there's ever been a time in your life when all of a sudden a song has come on on uh, on your ear pods or or uh, or movie on television or or whatever, so, or you've come to a place and you just all you become very emotional and almost cry and sometimes just do cry because you're in touch. It connects you to a point early earlier in your life where you had something very meaningful or very painful happen to you um so uh impressionism has a lot to do with our feelings and how we feel the original impressionists were artists who reacted negatively to the Enlightenment, to the growth of science, to the growth of industry, to the growth of the pollution in the air, the whatever there is. There were, there, there were just people who reacted in a negative way and they kind of uh, were shunned uh, by academicians. They were the hippies, as we said in the last lesson, of the 1800s. They were kind of anti-establishment. And in turning uh, away uh, from the really fine detail of the neoclassical artist, for example, they aimed to capture a momentary sensory effect of a scene, uh, of a moment, uh, of an object, the, the moment of a, a fleeting thought. Uh, take the death of Socrates. Socrates, that captures a moment, but the purpose of that is to say, rise up, Frenchman, there are things worth dying for. Well, Impressionism, that's not the purpose of Impressionist art. The purpose of Impressionist art is to make you feel something in the moment. It has a very existential element to it. A lot of people are afraid of that word existentialism. Uh, but they don't understand. It just means the, the first five letters of existentialism is its own definition to exist. What does it mean to exist in the moment? And of course, you can't hang on to that moment because the time you're in that moment, it goes to the next moment. And so Impressionism is to capture that moment, not just the visual, but the internal feelings of it. And so to do that, these Impressionist artists moved outdoors. Whereas their studios used to be indoors. The Impressionist artists move outdoors. And it, it, a new term for that arises. It's called plein air. That's the French. English plain air. Plain air painting. You're not indoors. You're outdoors in the plain sunlight. That's your light. Uh, your nothing is manufactured. It's just everything is natural. Plain air painting. Important concept. You may want to try to remember that. Now, Monet, in his more adult years, uh, he had lived in London, and then he came back from London. Uh, in London, he was just everywhere it was the industrial revolution there was so much pollution in the air the Thames River was 
always stinky dead bodies floating down it, dead animals, all of the sewage into the river that runs right through London. Horrific, very horrific. And in London, actually, Monet did some of his best paintings. But like he would paint the Tower of London. But what he would say about it is he wasn't actually painting the tower. He was painting what was between him and the, and the tower. That is the fog or the pollution. And then later he moves back to France and just outside of Paris buys this little farm, not a working farm, just a piece of property. Uh, it's called Giverny. It's a, it's a, he turns it into a lush garden. It's kind of a garden of Eden. And he's continually working on it, the flowers and the shrubs. And all of his painting is done outside. You can go to Giverny today. It's quite an experience. You can stand where he stood and paint it. The, the painting that you're looking at right now is uh, the, the walkway into the back entrance of Giverny. And you can see the, the flowers, the, uh, the vines as they whirl up over the, uh, uh, the pergola type arbor that you walk through to get in. Uh, Monet was the leading French Impressionist. And again, he literally gave that movement its name. We get the name Impressionist Painting from Claude Monet. You may see that again on a final. I haven't read the final yet, but that would be a great question. Which one of the following four people gave the name Impressionism to that form of art? List four names. You see Claude Monet. You need to choose Monet. Uh, look at these water lilies. Now, who would think much about water lilies? If you were at my house, and I used to often have my classes come over to the house for just a little social or reception or something, uh, but during the COVID and stuff, we haven't been doing that. But my our, our den downstairs has a number of Monet paintings in it. Not originals, trust me. They're millions and millions and millions of dollars for each one of them. Um, this is one of my favorite water lilies. And he would literally put on his waders and walk out into this pond and move the water lilies around to where he could see what uh, what what was what looked more artistic or or connected more deeply in his own soul Water lilies was one of his favorite things to paint. You don't think much about that. When I was in Kansas City with Jan, my, my wife, at this exhibition, there would be whole walls where you'd see a painting of water lilies that was as big as a big hallway wall. Just water lilies. And um, again, I, I loved that uh, that part of of Monet's paintings, but he painted a lot of other things too. He was exceptionally talented. Uh, he was very talented also in the sense of coalescing other artists into this art form and really growing the uh, field of Impressionist art. And what you're looking at here is the Japanese bridge. It's got this pond 
in the backyard. It's filled with water lilies. He's got this bridge. This same setting will be painted all throughout the year, different seasons of the year. So I don't know. This looks to me like a maybe a spring season, possibly fall. I'm not not sure. He calls it symphony in rows. The harmony of all of the colors here. Just. Hey, Dr. Bell. Yes. I have a doctor's appointment I have to go to. Who, but... um, who is this? Dennis. Dennis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Not I a... checked in though. Good. Dennis, so great, you know. great to have in class. I think you emailed me about that. Doesn't matter. You're here. You got credit. Glad you're here. If you got any questions, let me know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good, good luck with your appointment. Thank you. Have a good summer. You too, man. You too. Bye. Um, so he would form different impressions of the same site at different times of the day. And so he would set up his tripod, usually in the same place, depending on what he was painting and paint the same scene at different times of the day, just like you would at different seasons of the year. That's Impressionism. Uh, I get a different impression from our backyard, depending whether it's morning or late afternoon. I get a different sense. It creates a different sensation within me. When he came to Giverny, as I said, you can go there. You could, if you go to Paris, make the trip up to Giverny. Um, he, um, when he bought this plot of ground, it was just overgrown jungle, and he transformed it into this garden. I've always liked that. Thomas Jefferson said, landscaping is living art. And you don't see that any better than you do right here with Claude Monet. Um, I love this guy, I love this bridge. I've got a little Japanese bridge in my backyard, which I've been built, I built it myself to kind of mimic that. It's not nearly that big, nor is it nearly that beautiful. Uh, nor do I have the beauty surrounding it that Giverny has. It's uh, it, it's kind of a, the, the Japanese call it a moon bridge. Not It's actually not quite a full moon bridge. The full moon bridge is much more radical and circular. Um, but this is the Japanese bridge. And in so many of Monet's paintings, you will see the Japanese bridge. Uh, he paints the atmosphere. Here's just another picture. You see the, or another painting. You see the, the Japanese bridge in the background. This is from a different angle at a different period of time in the year. It looks like summer to me. Again, it's the water lilies. He loved painting water lilies. And as he grows older, his eyesight begins to get worse. And his painting becomes more abstract. And partially that's because he doesn't see as well. But I think partially it's also because he's really trying to paint truthfully what he is seeing. Um, here's an example of one of his later paintings. The abstraction is incredible here. You can tell his eyesight is really deteriorated. So let's move on a little bit to post Impressionism. 
Uh, they believe the post-impressionists, obviously post means after these artists who come basically after the impressionists, they believe that the work of art should not revolve around style or process or aesthetic approach, but that it, it should take all of those things, but then those things should be a symbol for something. Something that connects to the unconscious mind, a symbol, a symbol of freedom, symbol of death, symbol of birth, symbol of sadness, symbol of friendliness, symbol of love, symbol of friendship. And so it builds on the impressionist approach that takes you into post-impressionism. We're not going to be talking about Paul Cezanne, but I like his quote, a work of art which did not begin in emotion is not a work of art. But the Impressionists then take it to say, yes, it begins in emotion, but there's a point to it. So it's kind of like the neoclassical in the sense that there's a point to it. Death shock. Socrates, some ideals are worth sacrificing your life for. But post-impressionism keeps the point, the symbol, but it also keeps the impressionist point of the immediate sensations that you're getting while you're painting this. This is, this is one of my guys here, Van Gogh. I relate to him. Um, he had psychiatric problems. <laughs> Maybe that's why I relate to him. I don't know. We all have issues, all of us. Uh, if you say you don't have any issues, your issue is lying. Uh, sometimes we can't confront our own demons. Van Gogh had him. He was so human. And in his lifetime, such a failure. Painted over 800 paintings. He said in one of his, uh, after reading all of his journals, all of his letters, he's got dozens and hundreds of letters that he wrote to his younger brother, Theo. After reading those, you get the impression that he only sold one painting during his lifetime. He was not popular at all during his lifetime. People didn't know his name. People didn't know anything about him. Let me tell you something very interesting about Van Gogh. Uh, his father was a minister. Now, to me, that says a lot because a child being raised in a minister's home has some advantages and lots of disadvantages. Um, we did everything we could, my wife and I, to protect. And I, I preached for... Uh, my last church in Texas was a very large mega church, second biggest church. And your family is a glass house. People can see in. Your kids are under a lot of pressure. We, as much as we tried to protect them, that was not always easy to do. Van Gogh's dad's a minister and Van Gogh has a lot of pressure on him. Van Gogh wants to become a minister. Uh, doesn't work out for him. But, uh, so he moves more toward art. His mother's family, in that family, there were a bunch of dealers of art, famous art paintings. They would sell these. They would be the managers for artists. Van Gogh was one of six kids. His older brother died. Van Gogh was the second. 
child. First child died. Here's the interesting thing. Now, if you're if you've gotten a little sleep, you take a big deep breath, oxygenate your neurons so you can catch what I'm saying here, because there's a very deep psychological principle at work here. His parents grieved so much over the loss of their first child that they named their second child the same name as the child that died. They were both Vincent, the dead child. And the Vincent Van Gogh that we know was born one year to the day after, after Van Gogh, after his older brother died. One year to the day. That's when the Vincent we're talking about was born. One year to the day after the death of his older brother, who was also named Vincent. Now, the Vincent we're talking about, the artist, had a brother four he had a brother four years younger than him, whose name is Theo, who plays very importantly in the life of Vincent Van Gogh. And it's Theo who pretty much pays Vincent's life, pays for him to live, gives him his livelihood, sends him money. So, but think about that. We, this guy's a genius. I mean, Van Gogh is a genius. He spoke what, four languages, Dutch, French, English. German, he dreamed of teaching people and helping people. He drew all the time as a child. He, in his letters, he wrote such with such wisdom and grace. He said, if you hear a voice within you say you cannot paint, then by all means paint, and that voice will be silenced. and go as a kid. His older brother, also named Vincent, died one year before him. And catch this now. Every day, as Vincent walked to school as a little boy, he passed the cemetery and could see the gravestone with his name on it. Ici repose Vincent Van Gogh. Here lies Vincent Van Gogh. Well, of course, it was the older brother who was also named Vincent, but it's got your name on it. I mean, how would it feel for you to go by and see every day you have to walk by a gravestone that had your name on it. So he lived in the shadow of death. And that affected him deeply. Photography was just becoming a thing at this point. Here's a couple of his pictures as he grows older. My favorite painting of his is a painting called Starry Night, which we'll look at in just a few minutes. I'm not going to play this video for you here because you've got time to do that on your own, but I highly recommend that you do it. Some of you may remember Don McLean. He only had two really popular songs. One was by, by Miss American Pie, drove my Chevy to the levee, and the levee was dry. The good old boys were drinking whiskey and rye, singing, this will be the day that we die. Sorry, I hope I didn't traumatize anybody there. Uh, but his second song was in honor of 
Vincent Van Gogh. It's, it's a rock song. And it's like he's singing it to Vincent. Starry, starry night. And it's just a, a beautiful song. And then as, as the song is played on this particular YouTube, there are various paintings that Van Gogh made that go through the lyrics and the rhythm of this song. Here's another YouTube that you can find more about the story of his life. Now, here's, here's my second favorite. And that's, this is one called La Glise de Vers. If you speak French, you know that means the church at Auvers. Uh, Auvers is a village. And I think part of the reason I love this painting so much is because I'm a preacher. Uh, but this church looks dead. It looks more than dead. It looks foreboding, squatting there like a great toad in the way. The road has to split to go around it. Uh, to, to me, there's so much symbolism there. I mean, for me, the church should be a bridge to help people get through life, not a barrier that they have to walk around. And that's why when you walk into my study, this is what you'll see. I, I know you can't see it very well because it's, the light and everything, but this is like least of theirs. Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent always wanted to be a pastor, but he wasn't suave enough. He didn't have the social skills of refined etiquette. He had some psychiatric issues, which from time to time caused him to be institutionalized. He studied to be a minister. In fact, I have, I have, uh, it's a copy, but it's a copy of his first and only sermon in his handwriting. I find it very fascinating. And then the church told him, no, you, you just really don't represent what we want in a minister. And I keep this painting up to remind me the church is not to be a barrier to people. It's to be a bridge, uh, and especially for broken people, for people who are hurting and in this church that you see exhibited in this painting on your screen and behind me, if you can still see that, I don't know if you can or not, but is anything but a welcoming place of renewal and grace and forgiveness. When I look at this church in this painting, I see darkness. I see deadness. I see turbulence. Look at the sky behind it. There is supposed to be kind of an optical illusion in this painting that if you look close enough in the foreground, uh, the little piece of lawn that's in front of the church, just to the right of the woman and between the two paths. If you look close enough, I'm told you can see a self-portrait of Vincent Van Gogh in there. I, I've never been able to find it, but I'm not good at that sort of thing. But here you have post-impressionism at its best 
you're living in that moment, but that moment is a symbol of something bigger than the moment. Everything about that painting attracts me and horrifies me. Anyway, I'll need to move on. Here's his painting, Starry Night, and it's pretty incredible in itself. You know, are, are the stars shining and the clouds whirling? I think so. Light in turbulence. Uh, is the wind blowing kind of movement and storm? Uh, the colors seem to have uh, their own feel to them. The trees seem to shimmer. Uh, I, there's In the middle of this, there's this church. In the middle of a lot of his paintings, there is a church. You see the very high steeple there in the middle. Um, there was a potato famine. There was a lot of uh, famines in that whole part of Europe at the time. And this is a one he called the potato eaters. He knows all of these people. He could tell you their names. And the potato diggers. Uh, he just paints things that he sees. And sometimes the symbol that we get from them may not be the same symbol he intended, but great art allows for that. This is the cafe where he took his meals every evening, the night cafe. Uh, this is a house in the little village in the southern France where he lived. And um, let's see, um, sunflowers. He loved to paint sunflowers. Uh, you think that's not a big deal. It wasn't in his day. Nobody was interested in it. But in, the 19, in 1987, it sold for $39 million dollars. <laughs> yes. He used very thick paint and he painted very quickly and they were very vibrant colors, sometimes very bright, sometimes very dark, uh, sometimes very stormy. It's all a reflection of what's going on in his mind. So he dealt, battled with depression and maybe some bipolarism we don't really know but he did have some psychiatric issues he painted himself a lot partly because he couldn't afford to have models in if you were a painter at the time you'd pay a model to come in and you would paint them you remember we talked about Caravaggio and all the models he would have to come in well of course this is 200 years later, uh, three, 250 years later anyway. Uh, and so he would paint himself. I think he was always trying to figure out who he was. But it's kind of easy to understand that when he's got a, when he's named after his dead brother. And it was very obvious to him growing up that his parents never really healed from the death of his older brother. They never really worked through their grief. And so it was kind of like they always wanted him to be something that he was not. So who was he? Uh, maybe that explains why he never smiled and why he was almost always in a very sad mood. Here's some more of his self-portraits.
This is bedroom in the little apartment he rented in southern France when he had moved there. And this is his last painting. So we're just about finished here and with this part. And then we'll go into the discussion class discussion. Uh, this is called Wheat Fields. Wheat Field with Crows. Very dramatic, very turbulent. It's his last painting. I, to me, this conveys really intense feelings on the edge. Dark, turbulent sky filled with crows. And look at that path in the middle. It just suddenly stops. People who speculate about this painting often wonder if the suddenness of the end of that path is kind of a prophecy of the end of his life. Because shortly after painting this, he dies. Uh, the official report is that he committed suicide. Maybe he did. I don't know. He had enough mental anguish that would make that almost understandable. He was living with his brother at the time and with Theo, his, his brother. And... Um, the theory is that he took a gun and just shot himself, took his brother's gun and just shot himself. I tend to believe another theory. Uh, there's quite a bit of argument here about whether he shot himself or whether he was shot by someone. There was a couple of boys in the, this village who were the village bullies, and they were so cruel. They harassed him, called him names, followed him around, ridiculed him. Uh, the story is that one day they found him in the woods masturbating. They go back into town and they tell everybody about it. And he is even further ashamed, more embarrassed. And so he started taking this gun with him when he went out to paint because they would come out to harass him. And there's a strong body of research that seems to say that the considering the angle of a shot into his abdomen, it had to come from somebody else, not from him. I don't know. I'm certainly not an expert on that kind of medical pathology, but it is interesting. It took him two or three days to die. Um, he made it back home to his brother's apartment. His brother lived in the top floor of this apartment building and he had to crawl his way up to the room and his brother Theo cared for him then until he until he passed. I don't know. This is the man who had problems. This is the man who at one point in his life, fell in love with a prostitute and he cut off his ear and sent it to her. <laughs> really romantic, right? How would you like to have been that lady receiving that ear? I'm going to show you Vincent's ear in the next slide here. But he had 
lots of anguish uh, during his lifetime. There's his ear. Now that's a clone of his ear taken supposedly from his DNA. You can go to New York and you can see this ear. I don't there, I get, I've given you a YouTube link there if you want to look further into it. It's kind of creepy if you ask me. I'm not really interested in, in seeing that, but it's supposed to have been grown and harvested from his own, from Vincent's own uh, DNA because some of his family is still living. In fact, just a few years ago, his great, great grandnephew, I think it's two greats, it may have been three, uh, became a, a film director and producer in Amsterdam. His name was Theo. He was named after his great, great, great grandfather, the brother to Vincent. So Theo Van Gogh in the, I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe, uh, had directed produced and directed a film on violence against Muslim women. And some, some of the Muslim guys, they really took offense and killed him in Amsterdam. Um, a lot of tragedy, a lot of sadness in all of this. <laughs>